All right, sorry to draw you back. So I know you, you may want to keep working on that a little bit, but I just the lecture section is going to kind of short. I just want to show you a few last things and then open up more time for the last exercise where you can keep working on this one or you can work on the next one or come wherever you want. Um, so, oh, yeah, question? I have a general question. Okay, question. How do you find things? And, and here's what I mean, right? I didn't realize you had in the handout additional information about the stuff. And so now I'm trying to find information about the OS pod. Yeah, so, so the question, I'm, I'll restate in very broad terms, is like, well, how do you find information about Python modules? Um, so partly, I think, do the Google search. So like, for I'm about to show you the URL lib module. And I suspect if you do a Google search for like Python URL library or Python URL module, the, in my experience, the, the hits are pretty good. So that, that's, what, that's the freeform answer. The other answer is that python.org is the sort of official maintained sort of standard where, and there's you know, it's very browsable, and there's a lot of organization of modules there. So I think those are two pretty good answers. But here is the problem, right? You search under OS, and they don't show you that there is OS.path in there that you should actually be looking at. You get, like, Yeah, I agree. So, so the, the comment is, if you just do DIR on OS, it's hard to know that you need to look in OS.path, especially because, sorry. So I agree. So I think DIR, is, it's, it's kind of a nice, quick, and dirty solution, but maybe doing a real Google search and really looking at python.org, if you really want to browse, is the, the more rich experience, clearly. Because DIR is like pretty bare bones, but it's, it's attractive for like quick and dirty. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have, the, there, there's no, yeah, I don't have a totally satisfying answer to that. But um, I mean, in a way, there, this is progress in software, right? That it used to be, you can see, I mean, you just had to write everything yourself. Um, and now with like Python and Perl and Java, whatever, like in a sense, you, you do have these libraries. I mean, it is a tremendous improvement. And now, but there's this cost of like, well, we have to kind of dig around and find them. So, oh well, progress. Um, okay, so I want to show you here is um, you know a couple of smattering of things, and then one more module, and then get to this uh, this last exercise. So first off, I want to show you um, this is just uh, totally optional. Okay, you, you do not need to know this, but I just feel like it, it's something that's useful to know. Um, I'm going to go back to my um, this is uh, hello.py. Oh, 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 okay. <clears throat> yes. Here we see the beautiful blue screen showing nothing. Um, so earlier, I had written um, hello.py to be kind of a, a cat utility. And so I've recreated that. And I want to I just talk about this a little bit, in particular to talk about exceptions. Um, the need, you do not need to know exceptions through the exercise today, but I just think it's something that's useful to kind of have seen. And so I want to spend a few minutes just mentioning how this works. Um, so what this code does is uh, here's this, this uh, function called cat, and it takes a file name argument. Um, and all it does is it just, you know, it tries to read it, and then it prints out. Here I had it print like dash, dash, dash in the file name, and then it prints the text from the file. And then down here at the main, uh, very much like the mains you guys have, it just takes any number of command line arguments, and it just tries, it just tries to cat all of them. So... Um, See, I guess I'll go with my two. I'll leave that text up there. I'll go to the other one. Ah, there's the other one. Okay, so this goes down here. All right, so if I go up here, so I could run hello and I could say, oh, please, cat. Uh, if I say small dot text, it prints that one. But I could list multiple files, so I'll have it print itself. So I list multiple files, and then there's this. So if I sort of scroll up, it printed. Here it printed small dot text, and then here it printed hello to put on it. You know, so any number I give, it's just gonna it's gonna give. So here's the problem I want to I want to deal with, which is errors at runtime. What if I give this thing a file first in line here of like, you know, no such dot text. So now what's gonna happen is it's gonna run the loop, and it's gonna try and cat that first one. And what's gonna happen is, and of course, yeah. You may have seen one or two of these over the last couple of days, right? This is, this is a stack trace exception. And, I'll do, and what, I, what I said yesterday is like, well, you want to kind of care about the, the, the stuff at the bottom is sort of the most interesting. So what this says is there was an IO error. There's no such file directory, no such, you know, hey, that, that's almost English. I think that's, that's pretty helpful. And then here it's giving us, well, here's the line where that happens. So you can see it was my, my open call on that file name. It, fi it, it failed. Um, and then up above, these are the lines that, this is the call sequence. So if I read this from top to bottom, well, it started at main in line 24, and that called cat on line 20, and then that went down to line 10. So it's kind of going from the past up to the present and then the failure. Um, now, the mechanism, the, I'm going to get into just a little bit of detail here, uh, that's going on here is called an exception. And what's happened is that this line, f equals open a file name, is said to have thrown an exception object representing a runtime failure, like, OK, this is not going to work. 
And the default behavior of an exception is that it goes all the way out to main and exits the program. It just unwinds the whole thing and like, OK, we're done. And you know what? That's actually kind of a fine default. right? You, you might use lists wrong or make all sorts of errors. And yeah, kind of what you want it to do is exit the program, print some kind of error message. So like, as a default, that's fine. But what I want to show you here is how might you intercept the error, print a message, and keep going. In particular, I think it would be really nice if that first one being wrong didn't crash the whole thing. It would be nice if it would print a little error message, but actually continue to print small notes. So if I could just hold your question, so like, let, me, let me fix this. Um, now, exceptions are kind of a, you know, a, a deep topic. And so I'm by no means am I telling you everything there is to show my exception. I'm just showing you like the most simple thing possible. All right, so the way to do this is I'm going to say try. Um, and so that's a little, this is called a, a try block. And then I'll say accept. And then I'm going to say IO error. So if I go back over here, the exception that was thrown to here is, is an, an IO error. So I'm going I'm to catch that. IO error. And I'll say a print, you know, um, <laughs> something. How about IO error? But at least I'll mention the file. So I'll say that, comma, what was the file name here? It's a file name. All right, so here's, what the, here's the dynamic here. What this try accept does, it's very dynamic. It's going to, in the try, it's going to try and do each one of these lines. So it tries to do that one, tries to do that one, tries to do that one. And if any one of them at runtime could throw an error, and that's going to interrupt the, the usual uh, series of execution. And it's going to jump from there, and it's going to pop to down here. So it's kind of a, it, normally code is very linear, right? It just goes top to bottom. This interrupts. It interrupts it and jumps down here to, the, now in this, uh, to if, if the exception matches, it jumps to here. And so what's going to happen is either this will read, well, OK, let's see if I did it right. Um, but my intention here is that if this executes normally, we'll see the regular output. But if it's bad, it'll just print this line. But in either case, the function will then just exit normally. And we're back at main, and the, the loop can just continue. So rather than the default kind of kill the whole program behavior, I'm, I'm at least scratching the surface of exceptions to kind of control it, print something, and keep going. All right, so now let's see. Um, and uh, you know, other languages have, a, have the same feature. It's called exceptions in other languages. Just Python just has its own syntax for it. Um, so if I do this one, all right, I think that is actually good. So there, there's, the, there's the first one failing. It says IO error. And then the loop continued and did the other two. Um, so um, so th th there was a question over here I was crossing over. Does Python run through the entire program before outputting anything? Um, so the question is, does Python run through the entire program before outputting anything? Um, Python does when you, uh, that's interesting. I'm about to do a thing, which a little bit shows this. But when you first load the module, Python does a linear pass to kind of uh, tokenize and read in the code. But it does almost no analysis. It's just really superficial. So it is then when the execution actually runs over the lines that more semantic stuff actually happens. Could you actually get like a, you know, a, an unknown variable error like without even, like if you just said like print hello and then print like blah, blah, and you didn't define blah, blah, it wouldn't. That's right. That's right. And so to, to, to sort of summarize, so for example, if I had, oh, this is maybe an excellent example. So let's say here I called some foo function, like handle error or whatever, which, and I'd have forgot to define it, like there is no such function. This code will compile and run fine so long as the exception doesn't happen. I mean, this is kind of what you're saying. So, so to sort of distill this, when you load a Python file, pretty much nothing is checked. Errors, you know, typos of variable names, functions wrong, just, just most totally errors are just not checked. It is only when the code actually executes over those lines, that's when it's checked. And that, you know, I'm sure you've noticed that for the last couple of days. All right, so let me, let me get back to um, the, uh, the main theme here. All right, so that's just exceptions is a deep topic. I just felt like I should show you just you know, six minutes worth, just a little bit of how they work. Yeah, question. I think what he's asking is reverse from which is set, right? Because, because this, in this case, I think he's saying that it's actually still our error without printing it. Well, let me, let, I, I'm not really following, but let me, let me just blunder ahead. There's some other stuff I want to show you, and then we, we could talk after class. Um, all right, so let me, what was it? All right, so that was the basic exception stuff. So I want to show you this other thing. I want to talk about uh, modularity a little bit. So I'm going to go down to the baby names directory here. Um, so modularity refers to this idea that you have code, you know, this is how any, any project starts off. It's like, well, at first it's just some engineer or some person working on something for their personal like, headache, right? And they're sort of solving it. And then pretty soon their teammates hear about it, like, oh, hey, can I use that? And you know, then pretty soon it's like, you know, Emacs. Um, so uh, just for good design or using Python, you want to think a little bit about modularity. And by that, I mean, it's like, well, something was built to solve one problem. 
can it grow or be reused by other people over time to like, so they can, they can use it as well. So just code reuse just within a project. Um, and I'm going to talk about this at two levels. The simplest level is just having a program take command line flags. This is a totally primitive technique. Um, and yet it's actually very effective. And it's used within Google a ton. So you'll notice in our programs we were writing today, like I didn't assume, well, it's going to write this, this directory, or it's always going to read that file, or whatever. Instead, I was conscious of always trying to feed in what it should read and what it should write into the program through command line flags. Um, and certainly, you know, clearly Python supports that. We've been doing sort of primitive uh, command line parsing. You know, I would just sort of do it by hand. That, that's fine for simple things. There are also our command line flag parsing libraries. You, you know, if you could go find the module for it if you wanted like more um, rich flag support. So that's a very basic thing to get right, but um, certainly, you know, step one for modularity, you would want to get that right. Um, the next layer up would be if you want to reuse someone else's module. And instead of calling their program as like a program and passing it flags, you really want to call their Python function. So someone, you know, not some office made of yours wrote a function, you want to call it. I'm just going to scratch the surface a little bit of how that would work, because Python has pretty good support for this case. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to look at my uh, baby names program here. And you know, let's get this back on screen. Oh, I'm sorry, is this the solution? No, I'm going to go look at my solution for the baby names. I think it's a little more interesting. And I'm going to do something that you should never do, which is I'm going to put a print statement. Um, I'm just going to say, hi there, right at the outer level. Now, I haven't talked about this a lot before, but when you run, when you load a Python module, Really what it does, what Python does is it, it executes it from top to bottom. And in this print statement, what that's going to do is it's going to print whatever. And the, executing this def, what that does is it sort of looks at the code and it, you know, it binds it to the symbol extract names and then it just continues. So it, and it's only when we get down to the bottom, oops, get down, oops, get down, uh-oh, what did I just do? There we go. All right, let me undo out of this. All right. Um, only when I get down here to the bottom, then when it gets to this if statement, then it actually calls main and that, that's the whole thing off. Um, all right, so I'm just going to save that. Uh-oh, uh did I undo my, my print? No, it's still there. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to control Z out of there. So that's, I, I edited it. And I'm going to fire up the Python interpreter. Um, now we've done import RE and import an OS, right? All this idea of modules you, you've seen a lot. Um, now, Python, the word module is really synonymous in Python with just a .py file, right? And a .py file, you can think of it as a little namespace. It just has some stuff defined in it. So what's kind of crazy here I want to show you is I can say import baby names. And what that did is that loaded the file, took all of its defs, and then that sort of print that I put in that you should never do, that, it, it ran it. <laughs> So when you load a Python file, it sort of executes it. And then because I put that print in there, it kind of, it kind of shows that that's what was going on. So now, this will kind of, now I'm going to kind of connect code you've written with like the way we've used the OS module. So it's neat. It's like I can do a DIR on baby names. And what I'm going to see is there's these underbar, underbar things. Those are kind of like internals that you probably don't want to mess with too much. But then like there's main. So there's my main function. And check it out, extract names. There's like that function I wrote. And in fact, if I say help of baby names dot extract names, it's like I get this little man page. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit out of here. I'm gonna control Z, so I'm gonna get a little fancy. I'm gonna go back to the editor real quick. Um, oops, 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 wrong editor. All right. Okay, let's just look at baby names. So here, um, I, have, I haven't talked about this a lot for your solutions, but here's my def of baby names. And then there's this big string. Right? So with the triple quoted string, so it just starts with three quotes. That it's just a string constant, but it's just allowed to span lines. Right? So it's just a way of having a big string constant. And then this is a little bit like Javadoc, if you've seen that before. So it's, what's happening is it understands, well, this big string that's the first line, that's probably the documentation for this function. So when you call help, that's how help works. Right? So, I mean, it's this really trivial system, um, but that's how it's you know, pulling up little bits of docs of like, what this function does. All right, so now where's my Python interpreter? <laughs> this one. All right. All right, so here I am in Python, and I've imported baby names. So now what I want to show you is I can call, what was it called, extract names? I can call extract names here from the Python interpreter. So I could say baby names dot extract names, 
And what, what does it take? The name of Babyfy. It's going to be like dot dot slash baby1990.html. Of course, I think that's right. So let's just try it. So here, what, it, what, this returns a list, right? List. Yeah, there it is. All right. So this, I mean, the stuff I've kind of said, but like, so for example, if extract names like printed to standard out directly, I couldn't reuse it here, right? But because, I mean, the way the function should work, it took its arguments in as inputs, it computes whatever it returns, and it returns to the caller, you know, whatever its output is. It means that now I can just reuse it. I can sort of pluck it out of this program and reuse it for like who knows what, some other purpose. Um, so obviously this is a deep topic, but I'm kind of pointing you in the right direction a little bit of like what it would mean to have kind of a well-designed program, well-designed function, and how uh, modules could share code uh, to build sort of bigger systems. And that's, you know, yeah, that's what big software systems look like. Uh, all right. So let me show you. So that's, that's, our, that's the style discussion for this section. Um, so the other thing I want to show you, oh, I guess I need the Python interpreter back, is I want to show you another um, module. Uh, right, I mean, in a, every lecture section today, I just keep showing you more modules of built-in code that you might want to work. Um, the one I want to talk about today, or this section, is called a URL lib. And this one has nice support for um, messing with URL. <laughs> You'll never guess what it does. All right, so um, the what, first thing I'm going to do here is there's a URL lib dot URL open. And I'll just give a URL, like say, google.com. And what URL lib does, it's neat. It takes a URL and it tries to make it look like a file. And so when I say URL lib dot URL open, it's trying to kind of look like that open command that you've used to open files. And it returns, I, I, I named my variable uf there. It returns this thing that's it's kind of like a file object, like the f, but really it's pointing over the network to this thing. So in particular, I can say um, uf dot read. And what that's going to do is it does the networking and like gets all the data and like here it is. And so I could you know, do, say, for example, I don't know, regular expressions or something like you, you could join this. Um, so URL, it has like a lot of features. You can set cookies and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm just doing like the most simple sort of uh, URL retrieval here. Um, so the other thing I want to show you here, man, look at all this. <laughs> Does anyone ever look at the source code of our homepage? All right, so I'm going to look for .gif in here. There we go. Okay. So th there, slash intel n blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that, I'm going to copy that. That's the URL of the GIF that's on today's homepage, apparently. Um, so I'm going to show you another uh, URL lib function, which is URL uh, retrieve. And what that takes is a URL. So I'm going to say google.com, and I'm going to paste in that. So I believe that is the full URL path of today's GIF. And I'm going to say comma. And what URL retrieve does is it does a download. So there's a GIF. And I'm going to say, let's call this like blah.gif. And if I run that, bloop, OK. Um, so now if I control Z out of here, if I do an ls, check it out, blah.gif. This may prove to be handy in our next exercise. <laughs> um, so I've just showed you two functions in there. Yes, I mean, in, in fact, there's a huge amount of stuff there for parsing URLs, manipulating. I mean, you can imagine all sorts of stuff with URLs and HTTP, whatever. Yeah, of course. There's like tons of built-in behavior there. And I'm just, I've just showed you like my favorites. Um, but if you want to do some URL thing, you uh, certainly want to look at that. All right, so let me go up and show you uh, next, our last exercise, the best exercise ever. All right, so this exercise is actually in the form of a puzzle. When you solve this coding exercise, you will know the name of the puzzle, or the, know the answer to the puzzle, but I'm just not going to show you the answer. Like, you just have to figure it out. Um, there's two parts. There's part A and part B. If you just solve part A, you're doing pretty well. I mean, that, that's kind of good enough. You can do part B if you want, but it's not really part. Um, OK, so here's the idea. Um, I had to think of some highly motivated and incredibly uh, realistic puzzle situation. So what I've done, I'm going to look in this file happy underbar www.corp.google.com. This is an Apache log file. And I'm going to look inside of there. Actually, I'm sorry, I have to tell you the backstory. The backstory is that there's this image. The solution to this puzzle is an image. And it's an image, for the first part, of something or someone that is very happy. 
And in order to solve the puzzle, I want you to tell me what, what, what is happy. What is that an image of? Now, what's happened is some evil person has taken that image and they've shattered it like pinstripes into a bunch of little vertical stripes of images. And so if you just have one stripe, you can't really tell what it is. You've got to really put it all together. And they've taken these stripes and they have scattered them over the internet somewhere. And each stripe has a URL that points to it. And what's happened is if we look in this happy underbar blah, blah, blah Apache log file, uh, and, we start, and it's just, there's just all this junk in here. But, and, I, and I, I should mention for security reasons, this is not a real Apache log file. It, I took some Apache log files and I anonymized them and I wrote a program to kind of put the pieces together, kind of like some Frankenstein thing. So if you look very, it doesn't really make a ton of sense, but syntactically it, 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 it's, it's accurate. It really, it looks like one. All right, so if we look inside of here, um, some, most of these URLs, so it, you don't have to know anything about Apache log files, but this is, that's the client URL, this is when it happened. This is the get with request that the client sent. So there's a, a client asking for just slash, which is like a very common thing to want. Um, and I'm going to search for the word puzzle here. Here we go. Some of the get requests have the word puzzle in them. See where that's tilde and parlante slash puzzle, da, 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 whatever. So the ones with slash puzzle in them, those are the ones that point to the image slices. And so your first job is process the entire log file, find all the puzzle URLs, and there's duplicates. So you have to eliminate duplicates and then sort them alphabetically. And then I want to just see the output um, nice and nice. Now, just for kind of regular expression purposes, uh, you know, without getting into a lot of detail about HTTP, the word get is going to be here, and then there's going to be a space. And then there's going to be a bunch of character, whatever it is that they requested, and then there's going to be a space. And then the characters that go inside of the URL is like kind of a mess. <laughs> there's the tilde, percent, whatever. So when you're writing the regular expression for this, I'd say um, look, look for the two spaces. Like the two spaces are for sure. And then just try and collect just all the garbage that's in between there. OK, so let me, um, or uh, you know, for example, uh, back, I'm just going to backslash uppercase s looms is like the nice way, nice way to grab that. OK. So let me try running this thing. So I'll go down to my solution directory. So I'm going to say log puzzle, and I'm going to give it um, that, that happy file. And so in the simplest case, what it's going to do is it pulled out all the puzzle URLs, it eliminated duplicates, and it just prints them one per line um, in alphabetical order. You appear to have stolen all of them. Excuse me? You, you personally appear to have stolen all of them. Stolen? No, 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 I created. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. So, um, oh, yes, uh, yes, I, wh who is the evil genius behind this, uh, <laughs> behind this exercise? Right? No one knows. All right, well, also, uh, yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first part. You've got them. Now what I want you to do is, uh, do, 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 I'm going to say dash dash tutor. I'm going to say uh, output. So what I want it to do is if the tutor uh, option is specified, I want you to find all the URLs and I want you to download them all. I want you to retrieve all the little slices and I want you to write them into uh, this output directory. Right? Each URL has a slice. I showed you URL.URL retrieve. So just grab them. Just pull them down. Um, and so I'm going to go look in the output directory here. And I want you to just give them names, like discard their original names, and just give them the name image 0, image 1, image 2, image 3, and so on. All right? Now we've got this problem. Each one of those, if I show you to, is like a, it's a vertical slice. If you just look at it in isolation, you can't tell what it is. And so what we need to do is put the slices together right? to like reform the original image so then you can look at it and you can see, ah, I see what that is. I've solved the puzzle. Now, the hard way to do this, the way I first thought about it is like, oh, well, I guess I could get a Python imaging library, which of course there's a bunch. And in the Python imaging library, I could kind of composite these things together. Oh, in alphabetical order is correct. So alphabetical order will do the slices left to right the way you want for, for part A. So that would be the, but then I thought of an easier way. The totally easy way to do this is to just have Firefox put the images together for you. And the way you're going to do that is let me just show you the contents of this index. Dot HTML. Just look inside of there. And what I've done, what you're going to do is just put a bunch of image tags together. 
just and just with no space between whatever, just lay it together, and then Firefox will just put this thing together, and you're you're all set. Um, so that will actually solve the thing. Um, so that is part. Uh, I guess that's parts A and B. That's just solving the first puzzle, and if you get through that, that's great. Um, there is a later part that's a little more complicated, where you can't just sort the images alphabetically. There's a slightly more complicated scheme how to discramble the left-right order, and so that's you know for a slight additional difficulty. That's the uh, that's what we're on. So what I'd like you to, guys to do is work on this for like a nice long time, and then sometime uh, maybe around 3:30 or so. Um, I'll interrupt you one last time for a few closing remarks and show you like a little bit of you know slightly advanced optional things you might want to think about type stuff, uh, and then you're welcome to stay and work on any of today's exercises kind of as long as you want. And then I, you know sometime after four you can kind of wander off and uh, do your regular job. Um, okay, so off to the code.